these judges could not say simply yes or no. I grant the citizenship or I don't. They had to explain why. They had to to write a, a page explaining why. And then it became, you know, the whole thing, the whole process became almost like a book full of pages. From this book, we extracted six phrases that I'm gonna bring to you over here. This is 1857, okay? It's about 150 years, 160 years ago. A Negro is not a human person and is property of his owner. I'm not a judge. A free Negro of the Af African race is not a citizen within the meaning of the Constitution of the USA. I'm not a judge. Negroes or, or slaves are regarded as being of an inferior order with no rights which the white man was bound to respect. Here's another judge. Those who believe in uh, slavery is wrong should simply refrain from having slaves. Here's another one. A man has the right to do anything he wants with his property, including his slaves. And lastly, the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his own benefit. Okay, so in 2021, we look at this, we read these phrases, and they don't, it, it's almost like, how come? How come did we sign up for something like this? In a, in a recent past, this is only 150 years. So this is completely absurd. It's just, it wouldn't apply to us today, okay? But at the time, 150 years ago, uh, the outcome was considered totally normal. There's nothing wrong. It, you know, the local society saw this as just another, you know, just another piece of text, nothing wrong, nothing alarming about it. And interestingly, six to seven years after this, the, uh, America proclaimed the end of slavery. So this guy has a very important role in making the whole thing about ending slavery happen. Now, for us, spiritists, if you look at this, we would not be able to produce documents containing these six phrases today. And it was something just for the time. It was just right for that time. So, it, you know, obviously for God, this is absurd. Something like this is absurd. So we start uh, realizing that there are differences in human justice and divine justice. There are some aspects in human justice that do not are not used by God or in divine justice. One of them is time. For example, you see, this is 1857. Today, that wouldn't apply. So time makes a difference. 150 years, 300 years, 500 years, things that happened a thousand years ago makes no sense to us today. So our, our judgment, our laws, they have to change. They have to we have to adapt these laws because of time. Time passes and we, you know, things change. Another thing, place matters. The same thing in another country, in another society, even at the same time, might have produced a different outcome. So place matters, time matters, and mostly social status matters. If he wasn't, if he had not been a slave before, he would probably be granted the American citizenship, which he wasn't. So these are three, uh, that's just to begin our talk. These are three aspects of human justice that are not part of divine justice. God does not use any of these three parameters here that you see. So we, by looking at this, only this so, so far, we start drifting apart, okay? Human justice and divine justice start to, you know, follow separate ways because this is not part of divine justice. Let's take another example. Uh, if you're Brazilian or maybe you heard about this, uh, there's a, a huge, huge community in Brazil, in the city of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, called Rocinha. It's a, it's a set of, there are slums, basically, very difficult place to live. Uh, this is a picture that you can see here. On the bottom part of the picture, that's the community, Rocinha. On the upper part, 
is another, of course, you can see nice buildings right by the ocean, nice beaches and so and so and so. That's a different uh, community, of course. And these two communities, as you see in the picture, are separated by one avenue, two lanes, one way, two lanes, another way, that's it. So look at this, Th these buildings that you see, these nice buildings that you see, those are where the richest people in the country, not in the city, the richest people in the country live. And on the other side, that's probably where the worst uh, in terms of uh, uh, material uh, possibilities, uh, this community is. So look at this picture, it's awful, it's unbelievable. But let's discuss this a little bit. So uh, the population of this community, it's about 70,000 people, 70,000 people. And you go like, well, I'm not sure about what 70,000 mean, because, you know, how do I relate this to my, to me here in the US, for example? Well, let me give you some references. Sacramento, okay, right by you guys, 466,000. So that's a lot more people in Sacramento than in this community. San Francisco, 805,000. Uh, New York City, 8.1 million. So these are these three US cities, they're much, much, much larger than this community in Brazil. Now, what is important for us to see here is this, the density, the population, number of people per kilometer, square kilometer. Rocinha has 48,000 people per square kilometers. And again, what does it mean? I'm not sure. Give me a better reference. Well, here's your reference. Sacramento, 2,000 people per square kilometers. San Francisco, 7,000, 7,200. Even New York City, less than 11,000 uh, uh, per square kilometer. Roasting at 48,000. So it's four times more packed with people, more dense than New York City. So these people live in, in difficult, awful conditions. Here's another picture taken from the very top, from very far, the same community. And you can see here in the half bottom of the screen, those are all, you know, uh, houses and, you know, it's really difficult, slums. Now, what do we take from here? There is a picture that became iconic when we talk about this. This is the picture. It's an image that became, it's a photograph, became iconic. Because what you have here is the boundary of these two communities. On the left side of the picture, the image, you have the community, Rosinha. On the right side, you have these nice buildings. So think about this. Think for a minute that you live on the left side and you open your doors, you open your windows and you look out and what do you see? You see this nice, nice building with, you know, private pools, one per floor and so and so and so. What do you think? You think it's just? Would you be happy about it? You think it's fair? Probably not. None of them will. Now think about the other, the other way. You live on the right side now. So you open up, morning comes up, you go. Oh. Would you be pleased with that? Would you be happy and, and you think it's fair? They don't think it's fair because they pay top dollars or whatever, a ton of money for these places and their panoramic view is not nice. It's not really great. So you see the left side doesn't think it's fair. The right side doesn't think it's fair. Well, how come if they are on opposite sides? So it's not fair at all for anybody. You see, there's more than just this. There are aspects here that we don't see because these aspects are part of divine justice, not ours. Here's another one. We saw three so far, right? Our justice is fragmented. It means sometimes I'm in favor of this and I'm okay with that. Five minutes later with the same thing, I'm not okay. Same situation, same thing. So our justice, human justice is fragmented. There's no continuity, okay? 
it's based on revolt. The people on the left look out their window and they feel, you know, they rebel. They don't think it's fair. And mostly our justice is based on material uh, things. It's very materialistic, very based on, you know, possessions and stuff like that. None of these three things are part of divine justice, none of them. So, so far, we saw three aspects before and three more here. There are parameters used by human justice, but they are not used in divine justice. So obviously, the outcome cannot be the same if the parameters are not the same. So again, we, we keep drifting apart from divine justice because we use things that are not used by God. Let's go a little further down. Let's, let's bring up a third example which uh, it's actually, this is a technical name, exoneration by DNA. What is exoneration by DNA? Uh, basically, in very few words, it means somebody uh, was accused of a crime, they were convicted, they are undergoing whatever sentence they have to. While they are, you know, uh, through their sentence, it is um, found through DNA exam that this person could not have been the criminal. He could not be uh, convicted. So we have to reverse things. That reverse things is what is called exoneration by DNA. Exoneration by DNA is something relatively new here in the US in the world, right? Because it depends on technology and technology for DNA uh, evaluation didn't come until recently. So DNA, uh, exoneration by DNA in the US starts in, in 1989. Okay. So far from 1989 to the present day, okay, we had 367 exonerations by DNA, meaning 367 people were convicted and sentenced, and they were not the criminals. Okay. Out of this 367, we're going to pull up some interesting numbers. Once they are convicted and sentenced, it takes each one of them 14 years to be freed. So, the, you know, the pace of justice is low and, you know, a, a lot of things have to happen before we can declare this person actually wasn't uh, supposed to be convicted and, you know, he's free. It takes an average of 14 years. Out of these 367, 103 were cases of false confession. Why and what is false confession? False confession is uh, you didn't commit the crime. I did, but I'm a very influential person. I got money. I got power. So I'm going to threaten you and your family and your kids that if you don't go to jail in my place, they're going to pay for it. I'm going to, you know, harm them, kill them, whatever it is. So these people, because of the situation, they end up confessing something they have not committed, a crime they have not committed. That's 30% of the cases. So the, there's a lot of lack, uh, morality, morality lack in here. Let's continue with the numbers. Out of 367, okay, 21 were already in death row. They had been convicted and sentenced to the death penalty, and they were not the criminals. And you know, hopefully, thank God, they were the, uh, the 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 whole thing was reversed. They got freedom. But 21 out of 367, 161 of these cases, almost half of it, uh, incurred in forensic mistakes. Forensic mistakes can be understood in two ways: a voluntary and involuntary. Involuntary forensic mistakes means we gather evidence from different places, different people, different situations, and we overlooked something in the evidence and we made a wrong conviction. There's no intention. We just overlooked something or we didn't have the information that we needed, something like that. Voluntary forensic mistakes means, well, if we do not put this guy in jail, somebody else will. And the somebody else that will uh, we don't want this guy to go to jail. So we're going to adjust things, make a, quote, mistake, 
and that's going to prove that's going to be evidence enough that this person who is actually not the criminal is the criminal so that's about half it's about half can you imagine something like this in in divine justice <laughs> no chance right here's another one that's incredibly troubling it was for me when i started when i started doing this thing years ago out of 367 70% of these cases, the person was convicted because of visual ID. What is visual ID? We see this a lot in Hollywood movies. Uh, there's somebody that you need to make sure it was the criminal. So you pick five to seven people. One of them is the supposedly criminal. And you pick four to six more and put them against a wall, right? Uh, through a window, you call some witness or victim, that victim or witness looks at all them and says uh, it was number one or number two or number three. That's called visual ID. Out of these 367 people who are so far exonerated by DNA, 254, 70% were ID'd by somebody who was either a witness or the victim and they were wrong. Okay, what does it tell you? What does it tell you? These are people like you and me. They look at six guys, seven guys, and tell them you was number four, when in reality you wasn't. Why? Because we need to get rid of the conflict. We need to practice justice by our own hands. Once I convict somebody, it doesn't matter if you was the criminal. It doesn't matter. That gets out of me. I, I, I have the sensation of freedom that's absurd but here are numbers we're not making up these numbers this is part of our judicial system here in the u.s this is awful and ugly several of these cases as you see here 254 took place but one of them in special caught my attention two of them actually i'm going to show you one this guy here as you see this gentleman here archie williams and he was convicted in 1983. He spent 37 years in prison for something he had no idea what they were talking about. He was accused of, as you see here on the, uh, on the slide, aggravated rape murder, and he had no, without the possibility for parole. Not even that. Life in prison, straight prison, nothing can be done. So he spent 37 years in jail and then thanks to dna exoneration uh, uh process he was freed last year in 2020 actually 2019 so he had to re rebuild his life and everything else the reason why i'm bringing this guy is he became very 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 famous here in the u.s when he went to one of the top prime time programs as a singer a talent singer so he went to america's got Thailand. And he sang beautifully, beautifully. And, you know, uh, b b before the actual uh, singing, the judges, the four judges, they usually they ask the candidate, you know, what do you do? What do you like? And so and so. So they ask him, you know, who are you? And he said, well, I'm an ex-convict for something that I didn't do for 37 years. And can you imagine the audience at the time and the judges? They, emotionally, they sank. All of them, all of them. And this guy just sang beautifully. He sang a beautiful song, Don't Let the, go, uh, the Sun Go Down on Me by Elton John. And so he, he would say later on, he would say, as you see here on the slide, I used to listen to this song in prison and the words would just come back up whenever it was needed. So he, he kind of got attached to the message behind the song, which was, revigorating for him and he was able to go along because of that one song so he would say freedom is on of the mind it's freedom is of the mind you know not the jail the physical jail i went to prison but i never let my mind go to prison when you're faced with dark times i would pray to what i would do is pray and sing 
this is how I got peace. Higher place. So this is a beautiful story. If you look at his story, that's very interesting. And he got out because of DNA evidence. Uh, there is a, a, a group of people, it's called the Innocence Project, that the, this group of people, all they do is help wrong convicted people to get rid of their sentence by bringing DNA evidence. Okay, he was benef he benefit from this project here. Now think about his situation. We we as a, a society made a judgment, put him in jail for 37 years. And there's something wrong with this, right? There are aspects that we use in our justice that are not used by divine justice. One of them, we fail at times. We fail. Our justice system, our judgment fails. God doesn't. We want to do justice ourselves. I'm going to fix things up. I'm just going to do it myself. We went back, well, not, not we ourselves, but uh, you know, society went back to this case because it became a national thing. So we went back to reinvestigate, revisit the day this guy was convicted. So what we found is this. The police officer that got the whole thing going knew he wasn't the one. So he called the witness and the witness said for a visual ID, the visual ID, the witness said, it's none of these guys. Then the police officer said, but I think it's number such, that guy, Arch Williams. So the victim said, it's not, it's not him. So the police officer stated that she said he was the one, even though she said, no, he isn't. And with that in hand, that false testimony, he was able to put the guy in jail for 37 years. Of course, after all of this, uh, people went back to the police officer and said, what, what was on your mind to do this? So his plain, simple answer is, well, if I didn't put somebody in jail, it would jeopardize my ability to be a police officer. That was his answer. How much of divine justice do you see in this thing? Less than zero, probably. Another aspect, our justice is based on revenge. God does not use revenge as one of his, its parameters. So, so far we saw nine things that we use in our common judgments and in our social system, judicial system, that are not part of divine justice. That sets things apart. Divine justice is one thing, human justice is another one. Look at this short video here. Okay, if you ask me what, what do you see, I'm gonna give you my answer. I don't know if you share my views. My answer is, I think this guy, which is, uh, his back is facing the camera right now. I think this guy is gonna assault or rob the gentleman. That's my impression. Okay, well, let's start the video a little bit before that. So you see the guy, he wasn't just by close to the man, he was really far from the man. So he comes all the way across, he gets close to the man, the, the, sir, uh, the gentleman tries to you know, protect himself, he thinks something's gonna happen to him. And right now, right now, my judgment say this guy is guilty. He was gonna rob this guy. He was gonna rob the gentleman, put him in jail or do something with it. Well, maybe we have to revisit the whole thing again. So here's the guy coming through all the way from far. He gets closer to the gentleman. The gentleman protects himself. Here's another angle. All right, now the question is, who should be convicted, him or me? All right? You see, that's what we call fragmented justice. We don't have, never ever, we have all the facts. But the outcome of our judgment is based on the facts that we judge, we deem they are, you know, the ones that should be used. This here is an example. The guy was actually doing the other way around. Instead of robbing the gentleman or trying to attack him, he was protecting him. 
and we were going to put him on jail or, you know, make him guilty of something. So three more aspects of divine justice that divine justice does not use personal justice. I thought this guy was going to rob the serve this gentleman. Our justice is punctual. We look at that one moment in time. We don't look at the whole picture. And that's what, what I call fragmented justice. We just look at that one moment. Emmanuel uses an expression to, uh, to, to refer to this, looking at just that one thing. He calls expressed cruelty. Very interesting name, expressed cruelty. We look at expressed cruelty, which is a very limited view of facts and things. So think about this, for example, we incarnate and discarnate several times, you know, through reincarnation. So we incarnate, discarnate, incarnate again, and so and so and so. Let's say, for example, at the current time, today, today, 2021, okay, I'm at this point in my that one incarnation here where you see the uh, red line. And I commit a crime. Something happens, I, you know, I commit a crime. Regular human justice is going to look at that one point, at that one thing, expressed cruelty, where divine justice looks at something different. It looks at the entire history from day one when we were simple and ignorant. So there's a fundamental difference between human justice and divine justice. It's called reincarnation. We don't have that in our judicial system. It does not apply to a physical, to one physical lifetime, to one physical life. So obviously we are prone to make mistakes, prone to be unjust by default, because we don't have all the facts. We, we do not consider reincarnation as a parameter. So that we can just look at this from uh, the top of things. We're not going to go into many details here because this is a totally different uh, approach. But from God, we know from codification there are two things, spiritual principle and material principle. Spiritual principle, again, without going into details today, okay? Spiritual principle develops an intelligent principle, which will later on become a spirit and become uh, be able to produce a pure spirit and we have a physical body. Okay, the mechanics and mechanism of this is not a subject for today's talk. Now, this is several layers here, okay? Human justice is just in one layer, just one. Human justice is just at the physical level. It does not see a pair of spirit, does not see the spirit, does not see anything else. Oh, but, but at the same time, we are down here in the yellow bar, and we complain to God about justice. How come? We are several layers down below from God. But we look at him, point his finger, our fingers up and say, this is what you need to do. You're not doing the right thing. You're not being just. Who are we? Right? And why this is happening? Because of all these parameters that we use in our justice, and they are not used by divine justice. If we can line things up, if we can parallel these two justices, human justice and divine justice, here's something we would come up with. What, what is the range of our justice? Well, it, it, it's very tribal. It's just the people around us or that small group, a small society, maybe a country, but that's it. It's not global. It's not universal. Something that we can go to jail for here in the U.S. might be perfectly acceptable in another country, in another place. So our justice is not universal. God's is. We use references to judge something that we wrote ourselves. You see, every time you say you're right or wrong, you got to stop and think, stop, stop, stop. If you're telling me something is right or wrong, you're using a reference. What is the reference that we are using? Because if I tell you, you know, you see me here in uh, pink shirts, I can tell you people in pink shirts, all of them are nice people. But that's, that's not a divine thing. That's my own reference. Tomorrow morning, 
I might wake up and say, well, today I'm going to wear a blue shirt. So tomorrow, people in blue shirts, no longer pink shirts, are nice. So you see, we write our own laws, which, as we saw, they change with time and place. The vine law is based in one thing, one law that we don't have a name for. So we have to combine three names to get close to it. Justice, love, and charity. The foundation of our law is revenge and judgment. The foundation of divine law is universal balance. You did something wrong here, you're going to have to offset. You're going to have to bring the universe in equilibrium later, doing something different. It's not an eye for an eye necessarily. For example, if I kill a lot of people in this lifetime, on my next lifetime, I could be a doctor saving lives. It doesn't mean that I have to be assassinated. It's not an eye for an eye. Our justice has several different nuances and favoritisms and fragmented truth. We, we pick, uh, when a lawyer is going to pick a witness, he interviews the witness first and tells me and, and, and tells himself, oh, I'm not going to pick this person because he might say this, he might say that, he might do this, he might do that. That's not universal, right? That's not impartial. That's not comprehensive like divine justice is. The longevity of our laws, we saw that, is very short. Uh, time makes a change. 150 years ago, slavery was something, you know, ordinary. Today, we can't do that anymore. Divine justice is immutable, timeless, and eternal. It was, it, it, it's, as we call, as we say, set in stone. That's it, right? Our ju justice suffers influences of people with power, cultural influences, uh, uh, things like this, daily life situations. Divine justice does not look at any, any like that. The only influence you have is your responsibility on what happens because of our level of evolution. More, more uh, uh, higher level of evolution means higher responsibility, more responsibility. Our justice is conditioned. There is no such a thing as unconditional justice. No, there is no such a thing. For God, it is not conditioned. Everything is, you know, it's a straight thing for the whole universe. Uh, the flexibility of our justice, you know, we negotiate, we bargain. We, well, this guy, if he goes to jail, this is going to happen. Well, let's, let's make this differently. So we overlook the law that we write ourselves. For God, Divine justice is personal, not transferable, never transferable. The purpose of our law is re-education for life. Which life? Material life. Never spiritual life. You see, you're never, gonna, never, never, never going to have a sentence like this. Your crime was so ugly and so, you know, hard to comprehend that your sentence is, you're convicted in your sentences. Uh, life in prison plus the first 10 years of your next incarnation. It's not going to happen. But for divine justice, yeah, you will. There's re-education for spiritual life. So like I said, maximum penalty in our justice is limited to the lifetime. You know, in divine justice, it depends on how fast I want to recover from that. Recover being offset what I did, put the universe back in equilibrium, bringing it back to equilibrium. We look at our justice, our visibility is the thing at the time, is very punctual. Divine justice is not punctual to each according to their deeds, as Jesus stated to us. Our justice is subject to things. It clings to materialism. Uh, it looks into power. It looks into possessions. If you have more possessions, you're likely to uh, amend and change the outcome of whatever is being judged. That does not happen in divine justice. Now, one interesting thing is the judge. In our justice, uh, uh, ju judicial system, say, for example, I committed, a, I, I, uh, I victimized, let's say, Joe. Okay. So now I'm, I com I'm convicted, go to prison, and there's going to be a sentence. So I'm the offender. So here I am. I go to the, you know, to the judge, and the judge is a person that doesn't know me and doesn't know Joe, and that's by design. That's how our justice works. 
He doesn't know me, has no relation whatsoever, same Joe. So he's going to make a judgment. So the person who judges him and, and makes the outcome take place is actually a third party, which is not me, is not the perpetrator, the offender, or the victim. It's a third party. In divine justice, the judge is the offender. Can you imagine in our justice, okay, in our judicial system, so now I'm convicted, I'm right there sitting in front of the judge. The judge says, okay, your crime was horrible. Do you acknowledge the crime? Yes, I do, sir. Okay, give us your own sentence, please. Can you imagine this ever taking place in our society? No, because the parameters that we use are not the same parameters that divine justice uses. Divine justice can and will use the offender himself as the judge of his own deeds. And the most interesting of all, the focus of our justice, like Emmanuel says, is the expressed cruelty. The focus of divine justice is not that. That's Emmanuel telling us. It is the outcome of the situation, the positive outcome of the situation. So our justice on the left side is totally out of balance. Divine justice on the right side is in perfect balance. But I want to come back to the list here. I want you to concentrate on this very last one here. Divine justice looks at the positive outcome. I'm going to say this again because I'm going to ask you something. Divine justice considers the positive outcome. And we go back to the first question. Is the crucifixion of Jesus just and fair? What was the outcome of the crucifixion? Half of the planet following him. Was that a positive outcome or is it just not fair? Positive. Do you see? Do, do you understand? Right? Do, do you? Uh, that's a very philosophical thing. But that's what spiritism is all about. It's a philosophy. Uh, Alan Kardec tells, tells us with the spirits, question everything. Go to the bottom of things by questioning multiple times, layer after layer after layer. So when you get to the spiritist literature, it is well explained to us that if you look at the fact uh, on a morning of a Sunday or whatever day of the week it was, if you look at that morning, those five or six hours that Jesus is being taken to the crucifixion, your outcome is one thing. When you look at the positive outcome, it's another thing. So hopefully you understand what the point is here. And if we understand this, and we take this to the smallest of things in the most of our lives, hour by hour, day by day, we start having different outcomes for the situations of our lives. And we, are, and we are going to be able to explain to us why we think that the outcome is this or that. We're going to start judging things differently because we will have focus on the positive outcome, not on the cruelty. So we look at the past events that we go through our lives and, oh, we want to do this. Uh, this guy deserves this and that. Well, let's revisit these things. So I created an enemy 20 years ago because of this and that and that. Because I was looking at the punctual. I was looking, my focus was the expressed cruelty. Now, 20 years later, maybe, hopefully, I will be able to revisit the situation and look at the positive outcome. And maybe he's no longer going to be my enemy just by looking at a different outcome. Think about that. That's why constantly we are hit hard by divine justice. It hits us hard all the time because we are looking the wrong way. The truck is coming from the left and I'm not looking to the left. I'm looking to the right and I'm going to cross the street. I'm going to get hit. That's what we do all the time. That happens to us all the time being hit by 
and run over, I would say, by divine justice. In the book Heaven and Hell, Allan Kardec uh, puts something uh, through the spirits, of course, uh, through him, the spirits put something out very interesting. Penal code of the future life. The penal code of the future life is, it's more like a penal code, right? Which is, what, what is a penal code in our current justice? It's something like this. Uh, very easy. Let's just make it very easy. If you rob somebody, you're going to spend one year in, in jail. If you kill somebody, you're going to spend 10 years in jail and so on and so on. So I don't have to kill somebody to make sure that I'm going to spend 10 years in jail because it's part of the law. That's it. I do it. I'm going to suffer the consequences. This is a more or less the same concept, the same thing, but not for a lifetime, for spiritual life. It's about offsetting our wrongdoings. If we did, the, if you did this, you're going to have to fix it. And there are ways to fix. This is what this entire chapter is all about. It's very clear, straight. It's a straight shot into the codification here. Okay. Now, I want to end with something for us to all take home. You're already taking home the story about Jesus and the crucifixion, okay? Take it to the pillow tonight. It's serious. Here's another thing to take to the pillow tonight. Imagine a tennis match, okay? So at times, there are situations where in, in the ball goes ver travels very fast, as you know. Sometimes the ball hits the floor. And you're not really sure because of the speed and, you know, we're our limited eyes. You're not really sure if the ball was in court, outside, or just right on top of the line. We can't tell. So you're watching the match. Physically, you went to the stadium. You're sitting right there, not via television, nothing like this. You're sitting right there. So the guy sitting here in this position will say one thing. The guy watching the same game at the same time, sitting in this position B is going to maybe say something different. No, he wasn't. You're wrong. The guy sitting here, right by where the thing happened, is going to say something different than the others. Same for D. And the umpire himself, sitting on the chair, is going to tell something different. The two players themselves are going to be have their own views. So who is right? What is the truth? Who makes the judgment that is you know, yeah, that's right or wrong. Again, right or wrong depends on the reference. What is our reference? It is ourselves. But we are just observers. We are not establishers of the truth. We are not establishers of the truth. I can't do that. I can only see, observe. These five people sitting here, as I named them, in the stadium, A, B, C, D, and E, they are simply possibilities. They are possibilities because I was sitting in A chair or, or in position A. I was not sitting in D because if I was sitting in D, my outcome, myself, same person, would have probably been different. So our truth, when I tell you the ball was out the court and I was sitting in A, that is not the truth. That's a fragment of the truth, a tiny, tiny, tiny fragment of the truth because you have 10,000 people watching the same game. At times, it's so complicated that the umpire has to go and say, Did anybody, was anybody recording this, taping this, like on television? I want to see this on the screen in slow motion because I can't figure out by myself. That is so complicated. So how can we dare tell people you're right and I'm wrong? But we do this all the time. For me to tell somebody, for me to have the nerve to tell somebody you're right and I'm wrong, or vice versa, right? Usually it's the other way around. I'm right and wrong. I would have I would have to be omnipresent. I would have to be in all 10,000 spots of the stadium at the same time, being the two players and the umpire all at the same time. And I can't do that. I do not have this attribute of omnipresence as the same way I do not have the attribute of being omniscience, meaning I know everything. I'm telling you it's the truth because I know everything. No such a thing. And I would have to be omnipotent. 
by saying, I know everything, I'm telling you this, and that becomes the truth. And it doesn't. It might become my truth to satisfy myself, get me out of my own personal conflict, but that does not establish the truth. We are not able to establish the truth, but we want to do this all the time. So two things you, I, I suggest you take home to the pillow tonight. This slide that you see here and the thing about the crucifixion of Jesus. Was it just unfair? Yes or no, but mostly why? So thank you very much, guys. Um, questions, comments, uh, suggestions. I'm all ears. Wow, it is amazing. Um... The, the, the teachings from today with the reality that we are living in our country today. Yes. It, it is uh, it is make a lot of sense and making a lot of uh, another picture in my mind. Uh, not just to to judging or to confront the truth for or point fingers, no? Because we will see it is very sad the situation in our country today, but uh, may maybe uh, with the situation is coming, uh, we'll, tomorrow we'll be looking behind and you see that was the best way, unfortunately, to change the direction of our history here. Yeah, I can, I can tell you one thing, for example, Tanya, if you look at the current events today as a citizen, your outcome might be one thing. If you look as a spiritist, your outcome might be different. Yeah. Yeah, okay. very, that, whatever the right views thing. of anyone is, it's just a different angles. It's like the tennis match. You're sitting in position A as a citizen, but you're sitting in position B as a spiritist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and when you sit in a position B as a spiritist, uh, we will be more clear in our mind and our heart not to contribute with the, the whole mass and judging and being putting our energy our, out there to, to enforce what is going on outside. So the as more a we, yeah, go ahead. So as a spiritist, we will we, we see with an open eyes and open heart, um, like uh, since the beginning of the election in 2016, the spiritual mentors just have been asking us to pray and pray hard and and uh, always they would say not judging not judging yeah e e every time we place ourselves in position b in anything uh, which is being a spiritist we are approaching divine justice we are gonna have on the long run even on the short run less conflict internal conflict I would say even for our own lives, we, we may not always understand why we're in a certain situation or why this is upon me or that is upon me. And the bigger picture is in reincarnation and what we did in previous lives, you know? Yeah, but, there are, no, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I, I, I saw that young, that, that the, um, the gentleman on, um, uh, on that show and he did, I, I saw him tell them who he was. Yeah, it, it was, it was interesting. Yeah, there are times where we knowingly recognize divine justice. These times are when we look back at something and we say that was a necessary evil. What is a necessary evil? Is a recognition of there was something grander than what I thought initially. There was a justice above mine. I really appreciate your presentation. You bring us a lot of food for thoughts and uh, reminds me of that saying that uh, the higher the knowledge, the higher the responsibility. Because what yep. you bring to our consciousness and awareness right now, it implies what am I going to do about it? Not in a justice system, but in my life. Because we are in this transition to a, a world of regeneration. So those are some of the aspects that we have to rebuild, to reconstruct and uh, build a new society. So 
it falls upon me or us as a spiritist to take that kind of responsibility. It's amazing. So I really appreciate that. And uh, I wonder, I mean, this lecture that you give, you should be giving at the uh, uh, legal courses at some kind of uh, uh, Harvard uh, law, certain law business type of thing, because I think uh, it'll be very enlightening for a lot of those justice people that are going through the profession. Yeah, well, uh, that's what spiritism is all about, is educating each one of us so we can have a better uh, yeah. society overall. If I may add one thing, I don't know if you have given some thought, uh, there's one aspect that seems to bring all this conversation to a core point where everything comes, which is the ideology of white supremacy. So anything on that? Well, it, it, the word supremacy is already unjust to begin with, right? Like I said, uh, uh, it's based on fragmented truth. It's any any supremacy of any type. Uh, we we just saw, uh, you know, 150 years ago slavery, and uh, if you look back in history, 500 years ago we had, uh, or a thousand years ago we had the Inquisition. Same thing. Uh, so some of them are better, uh, better Christians than others, and it goes throughout history because it's just human nature, and it has to do with the level of uh, uh, advancement, moral advancements that we are, which is already, you know, very low. But any type of discrimination, meaning uh, 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 separation, you know, there's this and that. It, it's it's not in favor of divine justice. We might get to a point where we you know, if you take a group of 100 people and 50 of them think one thing, think they are better, the other 50 also think they are better, that's half and half. The problem is uh, when instead of 50 to 50, you have two to 98, that's a problem. And the worst of all is when it's one to 99. One to 99 means I look at the world, whatever it is, whatever, any, any time throughout the day, I look at the world, situations, and I say to myself, maybe I can even express this, but I say to myself, the world is divided in two, me and the rest. That's the worst supremacy, using the word that you brought up. That's the worst of all. That's... You cannot be any more away or drifted away from divine justice than that. Another striking visual that you brought out was those pictures between uh, the Hosinia and the other uplifted city. Those yeah. of us that live here in California, whenever we venture to go into Tijuana and Mexico, at the border, yeah. we see that yeah. same picture. I don't know those of you if you remember that. It's the same thing. Every yep. time I cross the border, I'm saying, "Oh my goodness, I'm in Belo Horizonte." Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And and you see the uh, both sides don't like what they see. They don't think it's just. So how come, right? Luis, thank you very very much. It was very enlightening. You know that um, you just reminded me about a chapter that I read on the book Good News, and I think it's chapter 20 or 21, where Jesus is explaining to his disciples, he's preparing them for the times, for the terrible times that are about to come. And they say, and then um, I think it's Simon Peter that says, Jesus, I don't, I, I would suggest you not to exaggerate so much because we can all get like frustrated and think if God is really just and then Jesus say, Peter, take it back because your understanding of justice is not the same of divine justice. If I have to go through this, it's because the, there will be a positive outcome, exactly as you said. Um, how, how people are going to believe on what I'm saying if I am not the example? So yeah. uh, if, if anyone is interested to see, there is this, this chapter that is very enlightening and it's very aligned with what you said, which is yeah. beautiful. All right, thank you. Is there any more comment? Any more questions? Oh, the episode of the American Most Talented is on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Just uh, 
You can do this. It's an outstanding presentation. I saw yeah. it too when it happened, Regina. You can share yeah, the a lot link of people cried, yeah. yeah. All right, beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Luis, for sharing with us this beautiful light. Um, we can all vibrate in the same in the same harmony. So thank you very much for this. Um, for those who are still here, we are taking five minutes break and we are coming back for the second part, which will take hands on healing. Louise, you are more than welcome to stay with us. We are going to do um, a meditation and hands on healing. So five yeah, minutes. Yeah, I cannot because I have another. I have another uh, something to do. Another appointment. All right. So I appreciate. We appreciate I appreciate Luis. Thanks so much. And hope Thank you can you, come back. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, you know my number, so you can always call me. We Thank you. I appreciate. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank, you. Thank Bye. you. All right. So five minutes, guys, it's 11, eight. So let's do three minutes break very quick. So we don't stay here forever. <laughs> right. Three minutes break. Uh, grab your glass of water, write down the names of those who we wish to bring for vibration, and let us set, settle down. I will put a song while we are here. <laughs> 